Good morning, everybody. If you would, open up your Bible, please, to the book of Genesis, chapter 39. Genesis, chapter 39, as we continue on in our study through the life of Joseph. Uh, Let me just begin reading at verse 7. We understand the context that Joseph is this young man who came from the family of Jacob or Israel. Uh, He came from a family of 13 kids, 12 sons and one daughter. It was a messed up family. Dysfunctional, maybe we would call it today. A lot of problems in the family. And chief among the problems was that the father favored one of the sons, Joseph, and all of his brothers hated him for it. They hated him so much that they uh, took him and beat him up and were going to murder him, but then they decided to sell him as a slave. And so he got sold as a slave to the Egyptians. And when we last left Joseph last week, he was a servant or a slave in the house of a man uh, named Potiphar. That's where we pick it up in verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. And she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he's committed all that he has to my hand. There's no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. What a story. Here you have a young man. Now, we know from verse 6, I know we started at verse 7, but verse 6 tells us that Joseph was an attractive man, handsome in form and appearance. So he's a good-looking young man, sharp, successful. He's got it going on. And here he is in this household where his master's wife, Potiphar's wife. Now, we we don't know anything about Potiphar. We don't know how old she was. We don't know what she looked like. But, But given that successful men of high standing, you know, often have wives that are attractive and such, we'll just assume that she she was an attractive young woman. And she tried to seduce Joseph day by day into having a sexual liaison with her. Joseph refused. It's quite a verse there in verse 7 where it says, his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph and she said, lie with me. It's really kind of an interesting pattern of seduction, isn't it? It often begins with the eyes, then it's given voice. She said, lie with me. And then there's the temptation that's either going to be resisted or given into. We can kind of speculate on why Potiphar's wife was so forward. I mean, isn't this pretty forward of her? We we wonder, was this a common thing that she did? Uh, We don't really know, but we can speculate on some of the reasons why she might have done this. It's possible that she felt deprived. What do I mean by that? Well, in verse 1 of Genesis chapter 39, in the New King James Bible, it describes Potiphar as being an officer in Pharaoh's court. I told you last week that literally that word officer is eunuch, that is someone who's castrated. Sometimes the word was used symbolically, sometimes it was used literally. We don't know if Potiphar was literally a castrated man, but he might have been. He may have been unable to have sexual relations with his wife. And maybe, maybe Potiphar, because of that, felt very deprived. Maybe their marriage was purely a ceremonial arrangement. And so she felt free to seek sexual relationships outside the marital bond. Did you know that our modern culture tells us today, it screams at us, it shouts at us and tells us that unless you fulfill every sexual desire that you have, you're somehow depriving yourself. And there's a lot of people who give in to sexual temptation simply out of the sense, I'm deprived. I mean, look, I I feel it. I want it. I desire it. Shouldn't that be fulfilled in me? 
Ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand this and take a look at this rationally and biblically. You're not deprived by resisting sexual temptation. No, you see, the idea that to say no to sexual temptation makes you deprived, that's a lie. And if you give in to sexual temptation, to every desire that comes towards you, I'll tell you what you've done. You've made sexual desire the God of your life. It's a brutal God. It will not treat you kindly. But you've just made that an idol, one of the gods that rules your life. Above the God who's enthroned in heaven, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God perfectly revealed to us in Jesus Christ, you've set sexual desire and its fulfillment above that God. Ladies and let me tell you, that is a brutal idol to live your life in servant of. It will not treat you well. It will eat you up, so to speak, and spit you out. I'm going to say something that's going to be radical in the ears of some of you, but it's entirely possible to resist sexual temptation and not give in to illicit sexual desires and live a completely happy and fulfilled life. Matter of fact, that is the pathway to a happy and a fulfilled life. Now, also it seems, and this may be another contributing factor to the forwardness of Potiphar's wife, also it seems that in ancient Egypt, the culture had very low expectations morally and sexually of women, including married women. It was assumed apparently in Egyptian culture, I'm not an expert, I can just tell you what I've read, but apparently in ancient Egyptian culture, it was assumed that women would have sex outside of marriage. And, and so we can get the kind of picture, look, Potiphar's wife, she's not looking for a relationship. She didn't want to divorce Potiphar. She's just looking for a good time. She's not looking for that relationship. And I tell you, here's another lie of our modern culture. Our modern culture tells us that sex is great and often better if it's apart from a meaningful relationship. Is this not one of the foundational lies of pornography? If there's anything that pornography screams to us about, it screams this, is that sex is better or, or more meaningful if it's outside of real relationship. But the truth, the truth biblically and as it is lived out in life is that sex is far better in committed married relationship. Listen, you can Google the statistics for yourself. Statistically speaking, who, who's most happy, who's most satisfied in their sexual relationships, on and on, and you, all these different statistical measures, you'll find again and again, it's married couples, it's married couples, it's married couples. You know why? Because sex means something. Do you realize that's, that's the great message that the Christian church has to proclaim to the world? Because in our over-sexualized age, where people seem to run after fulfilling every sexual desire, in our over-sexualized age, here's the issue. Sex doesn't mean anything. It's just the pursuit of a pleasurable activity. You, you could go surfing, or you could have sex. It's just a pleasurable activity. <laughs> Listen, the teaching of the Bible and what we can proclaim to the world is no. Sex is filled with meaning. And as we honor it, as God has given it to us, both for society and in revealed by his word, it is filled with meaning and it becomes better than the world could ever imagine. Ever imagine. No, when we understand and live out what the Bible says about sexual morality, we have it far better, infinitely better than a world that treats it as meaningless. And don't ever believe the lie that would tell you something different. Now here's something else that may have been a factor. Of course, we know from verse 6 of Genesis chapter 39 that Joseph was an attractive man. And perhaps this had something to do with it. She just looks at here's an attractive man and he's out of my reach. He says no. It wouldn't be the first time that somebody seemed more desirable because they were unobtainable. And the Potiphar's wife looks at Joseph and goes, here's a challenge. He's on the table. I want him even more because he says no to me. 
And all bound up in this is, is this idea. Well, let me just put it to you this way. When I think about this whole passage, I genuinely feel sorry for Potiphar's wife. I feel sorry for her because she looks to Joseph and this is what she says. She says, show me that I'm still desirable. Joseph, show me that I'm still worth something. Here's a woman whose entire identity is wrapped up in this idea that if I'm not sexually desirable to somebody, I'm nobody. So, so I have to continually find another person to conquer, another person to tell me that I'm worth somebody, that I mean something in this world, and it's all empty, and it comes back to her in this black void of emptiness again and again and again. She's screaming, show me I'm desirable, show me I'm worth something, and our modern culture buys into the same thing as well. God has a greater meaning for you than how you express yourself sexually. God sees you. I wish I could say this. I would have a counseling session with Potiphar's wife. Of course, I, Ingalil and I would counsel her together. <laughs> and Ingalil would give the most Holy Spirit-inspired wisdom, and she would say, you know, you're more than your sexual desires. You are made in the image of God. And if you'll give your life to Jesus Christ, you'll find that his kingdom and your worth in him far exceeds anything else. Stop selling yourself so cheap. You're, you have a greater call, a greater destiny than this. And so we look at it all and we think of how the temptation came back to Joseph again and again. We look at that statement in verse 7 where she just came to lie with me, lie with me. It was a bold and a strong temptation. By the way, the Bible's very real about these bold and strong temptations. Do you feel like you're somehow unique? Isn't that what the devil wants to whisper to everybody? Oh, listen, you face temptations that nobody else has ever had to deal with. No, but instead the Bible tells us that no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And we all have a way of escape for a temptation provided for us in Jesus Christ. So no, you don't have to feel alone or isolated. Joseph knew what it was like. He knew what it was like, but look at the phrase in verse eight. But he refused. Friends, Joseph gave many reasons for his refusal. I think we can kind of chart these out, five or six different reasons found in verses eight, nine, and 10. The first thing is, notice it in verse eight. He said, he said to his master's wife. Now, he spoke to her, but he spoke to her not about sex, he spoke to her about his faithfulness to God. The first thing I noticed about Joseph when it says that he said to his master's wife was he governed his speech towards Potiphar's wife. Now this is very important. And for some of you, this is a word of wisdom from God that you need to pay attention to right now. If Joseph would have had flirtatious talk with Potiphar's wife, if the walls of resistance would have been torn down by just talk and conversation. Oh, I talk a little bit about sex, a little bit about this, and we're just, we're just joking, we're just flirting around. Listen, that's how the walls of defense get broken down. Joseph was not that foolish. He wasn't gonna play around with this. No, instead of flirtatious or, or maybe talk filled with jokes and double entendres, no, forget about that. He just simply answers back as a godly man would answer back. Listen, flirting and provocative words, they lead to disaster. Second thing Joseph did, notice, he remembered his responsibilities. Look at verse 8. He says, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he's committed all that he has to my hand. Joseph remembered how much he had to lose. I mean, here he was. He goes, listen, I, I came from the pit. I was sold as a slave, and now I've been brought up to this place of comfort and prestige in this house. And lady, uh, sitting with you would risk it all. There's no way that I can do this against my master Potiphar. There's no way that I can give in to this. You know, friends, I, I just plead with you. In the midst of sexual temptation, would you please remember how much you have to lose? 
It's an easy lesson uh, for those who are married, for those who have children, for those who have families. You think, listen, I don't want to lose my spouse. I don't want to lose my kids. I don't want to lose my marriage. I I'd want to fill my life with the complications of divorce, of alimony, of legal contentions, of bitterness. Of No, forget it. I've got too much to lose. I'm not going to do that. But you need to remember those things. Don't you know, friends, that in the moment of sexual temptation, or maybe I should say in a season of sexual temptation, that it's kind of this fog comes upon a person that enables them. They don't think clearly. They, they become an idiot. And they don't see what's going on. Things that would be entirely clear to somebody else. What, are you kidding me? You're, you're playing around with this? Don't you know where this is going to lead to? They either don't see it or they act like they don't see it. No, you need to remember those things. You need to remember. You need to have a wake-up call right now. Remember how much you have to lose. But then I think of a single person. A single person could do this calculation, and I get it. It makes sense to me. Single person would say, well, what do I got to lose? I'm not married yet. I don't have kids that'll be alienated. I'm, you know, it's, I'm kind of, it's not the same place. I really don't have much to lose if I'm sexually promiscuous, if I, if I have sex outside of God's plan in marriage. Oh, dear brother, dear sister, you have a lot to lose. And you need to realize that, yes, you, you don't have a marriage to lose yet. You, you don't have children to leave behind you yet. But you know what you have to lose? I hesitate to say this because it's going to sound foolish in the ears of many of you. Because it sounds foolish in the ears of this world. But I'll say it anyway. Dear single person who's being sexually promiscuous, I'll tell you what you have to lose. You have to lose your innocence. Now the world laughs at that. Innocence is despised in this world. But you and I know that there's something precious in that before God. There's something worth holding on to so that you're not jaded, you're not tumbled around by the effects and the abrasions of sin. But rather, there's something pure. There's something, I'll say it again, there's something innocent in your heart that's beautiful before God. Even as I say those words, I think of a single person who thinks, well, David, that innocence ship, that's sailed for me. If you've seen the things I've seen, if you've done the things I've done, yeah, innocence, that's about a million years ago. No, I'm here to tell you, if you walk the way God calls you to walk, Jesus helping you and empowering you, I, I'm here to tell you, innocence can be rebuilt and reclaimed in your life. It really can. It, it, it's not like, a, like it can never be what it was before. No, God can rebuild. God can restore. Don't let the devil tell you different. Don't let the devil tell you that, that, that one or a few or a season of compromise ruins it for the entire. No, God can rebuild if you'll turn it back to him now. And you can have that powerful thing in your life, that measure of innocence. I think of a third way that Joseph was able to overcome this temptation. It's in verse 9, where he simply said to Potiphar, uh, Potiphar's wife, you are his wife. I'm not married to you. You're married to somebody else. You don't belong to me. You belong to somebody else, and somebody else belongs to you. It's just not appropriate. Let's cut through that fog of craziness that can come upon people in a season of sexual temptation and say, forget it, I'm going to see facts for how they are. You, you are someone else's wife. And then fourthly, Joseph remembered what the act actually was. Do you see what he called it in verse 9? He called it great wickedness. It, it wasn't an affair. It wasn't a date. It wasn't, you know, all the other kind of euphemisms that we might use. Joseph, look at this. I'll tell you what that is. That's great wickedness. We often want to call sin by another name. Hostility and temper are self-expression. Pride is self-esteem. Gluttony is the good life. Covetousness is trying to get ahead. Perversion is an alternate lifestyle. Adultery is a cry for help in a bad marriage. 
We can put all kinds of different sugar-coated titles on it, but it doesn't change it. Joseph was able to look at it, and, and with a clear eye, that's great wickedness. I see it for what it is. Again, he wouldn't be enveloped by the fog of, I'll say it again, stupidity that comes upon many of us in a season of sexual temptation. But Joseph remembered something else. Look at verse 9. Joseph remembered that the sin would be against God. He said, how can I sin against God? You know, if you look at the, boy, it's funny, because I'm, I'm going to use the terminology of the world. I'm going to use not intelligent terminology here. So g- grant me this, would you please? Joseph looked at this opportunity. Yeah, like an opportunity to shoot yourself in the head. But he looked at this opportunity as being risk-free. And again, that's a crazy way to talk as well, because it's never risk-free, is it? Never. But, But that's the way we think. We think that the enticement to sexual immorality, number one, is an opportunity. Good heavens. Number two, we think that it's even possible that it could be risk-free. But that's how Joseph could have chosen to see it. He could say, listen, this is a pretty sweet arrangement. I mean, look, it's just me and Potiphar's wife. She's got reasons to keep quiet. I got reasons to keep quiet. We can keep this secret between the two of us. What's the harm? Nobody will know. We can get away with it. But when you bring God into the equation you realize there is no getting away. It just doesn't exist. God in heaven sees. And it may be that you never get found out, so to speak, by other people. God in heaven sees and knows. Friends, Joseph cared about more than getting caught. He knew that everything happened before the eyes of God. And he had a real enough relationship with God that he cared more about that than getting caught before human eyes. The the, the best thing that will preserve you from sexual temptation is a real, right-on, vibrant relationship with God where you realize that he's over everything in your life. And that you have to think about much, much more than being caught, so to speak, by human eyes. But it all came down to this. Joseph simply refused. He said, no, I won't do it. Even though, look at it there, verse 10. Even though she spoke to Joseph day by day that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. Joseph showed amazing faithfulness towards God, towards Potiphar, and even towards himself by resisting this temptation for many years. Now, in all this, we rightly admire Joseph. We say, Joseph, you're a great example of a man who faced sexual temptation, and you did what was right before God. You know, and the Bible gives us many examples of men and women who didn't resist. Men and women who didn't always stand strong against that sexual temptation or temptation of other kinds. Think about the people in the Bible who failed under temptation. You have Adam and Eve. You have Abraham and Moses. You have David and Solomon. You have John and Peter. You have many people in the Bible who failed under temptation. But then you have other people who didn't fail, or these thought that were spoken of. Joseph didn't seem to fail under temptation. Daniel didn't seem to fail under temptation. Yet none of those compare to who? To Jesus. Jesus was tested and tempted in ways that we can't even imagine. Yet he remained perfect and sinless. You know, look, we we don't know what Jesus looked like. I know you got a picture of him at home, but forget about that for a minute. We don't know what Jesus looked like. We we don't know how attractive he was physically speaking as a man. But I will tell you this. Everybody would know this. Jesus had an incredibly attractive character. Did he not? Would not Would not women be drawn to Jesus in a romantic way? Have you ever thought of how many times Jesus had to turn down Potiphar's wife, so to speak? How many times this or similar temptation came to him? Yet Jesus remained absolutely sinless. Now, I say this because you and I, we struggle with temptation, don't we? Well, I do. 
I hope I can include you. I don't want to be all alone up here as the one who struggles with temptation. But this is what I understand. I understand simply this. That the one who perfectly overcomes all temptation, he lives in me. I have surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. I put my trust in him. I am born again by God's spirit. That means Jesus lives in me. The good news is this. The one who perfectly resists temptation lives inside of me. So as I learn how to die to self and live to him, I can overcome temptation as well. The the answer isn't found in me, it's found in Jesus. But having surrendered my life to him, having put my faith in him, yes, yes, Jesus lives in me. Now Joseph's temptation came back at him again and again. Look at it here, verse 11. It says, but it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside that she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. You see, this is the picture that we're given in the scriptures is there's this environment of temptation all the time. All the time around Joseph, and Joseph resists, resists, but there came a day where it just came to a specific point that was extremely difficult for Joseph to deal with. And what was the point? Well, Potiphar's wife became more brazen than ever before. You know, none of the other men were in the house. All the servants were sent away. Gee, I wonder who sent them away. And Potiphar's wife's scheming. She goes, oh, this is going to be it. I'm going to let Joseph, hey, everything's okay. We'll never get caught. This will be the opportunity. And she comes to Joseph more brazen before. She's not just touching him with his words, but she touches him with her actual hand. And she grabs his garment. She says, come, lie with me. Verse 12, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But what did he do? He left his garment in her hand and he fled and ran outside. Now, nobody should think that Joseph ran away naked. It's just, we would say he ran away in his underwear. His, his, you know, his, his outer garment was taken away, and, and man, he, just, he, just, he ran. He said, i got to get out of here. I'm not going to stand against this. I'm going to run from it. Listen, Joseph did what we're all supposed to do when we're faced with this kind of situation. He fled and he ran. Let me read to you 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. It says, flee also youthful lusts. Look, let's be honest. Sometimes we run towards sin. God forgive us and change our heart, but sometimes that's us. Sometimes we pray the prayer that somebody prayed as a joke. They prayed this as a joke. Lord, lead me not into temptation. I can find it all by myself. Sometimes we run right at temptation. And friends, if that's you, you just got to humble yourself before God and say, God, change my heart. I'm messed up. You got to cleanse me. There's something wrong here. Sometimes we run towards temptation, but that should never be us. And sometimes we don't run towards it but we linger in the presence of temptation. And there have been many men, many women, who thought they could stand, well, you know what, I'll just linger in the presence of this temptation because it feels kind of good, but I can stand against it. Now, I want to make this very clear, and I please hope that you'll listen to me on this point. It is not a sin to be tempted. And the reason why I say that is that for some of you, the devil is heaping Big combin- a big condemnation upon you just for the sake of the fact that you're being tempted. It is not a sin to be tempted. Do not accept the devil's condemnation. The next time the devil tries to condemn you simply for being tempted, you just tell him to shove it and you find your place in Jesus Christ. But, but, to entertain the temptation, to willingly linger in the presence of that temptation... Friends, you're putting yourself into a place of sin. What we need to do is run away from temptation. I like what it says in the King James Version of Genesis 39, 12. It says this. Let me read it to you. He left the garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Listen, nobody else was going to get him out. So he had to get him out. I got me out. I'm gone. I'm out of here. Well, listen. God will give you the strength to overcome temptation, but he won't do it for you. So get yourself out. Run if you need to. 
God will provide a way of escape, but you have to take the way out. And he left his garment behind. You know, I have this scene in my mind. I picture Potiphar's wife there holding the garment. There she is, she's holding. Can you imagine what she's feeling at that moment? Well, let's read it. Let's look here at verse 13. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them saying, see, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to me to lie with me and I cried out with a loud voice and it happened when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. So she kept his garment with her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with words like these saying, the Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to me to mock me and so it happened I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside there's Potiphar's wife holding Joseph's garment Joseph ran he just ran out of the house now listen Potiphar's wife she's a bad woman but there's something in me that feels really sorry for her that pities her Because here she is, she's thinking, I have all my identity wrapped up in being sexually desirable to somebody. And this guy won't have me. I guess I'm worth nothing. I guess I have nothing. These idols I have served have betrayed me again. And she's so filled with shame She's so filled with indignation that she looks at that garment, she looks at her own heart, and the only thing she can do is start screaming, rape, rape, rape. She tells her husband, it's not fair. It's not fair at all. Joseph is not being rewarded in any immediate sense for his faithful stand for temptation. And I just want to let you know, if you're going to make a stand against temptation and seduction in your life, you're going to pay a price sometime or another. Let's just be real about it. I'm not trying to paint some some primrose path for you. No, there's going to be time you say, no, I'm going to be a man of God or a man of woman and God helping me and Jesus living inside me. I'm going to do what's right in the area of sexuality in my life and honor God with it. There's going to be times where you pay an unfair price for it. You just got to accept it. Okay. I'll trust God in the big picture to make it worth it. But the immediate effect, look at verses 19 and 20. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him saying, your servant did to me after this manner that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined and he was there in the prison. Friends, look at the words of verse 19. His anger was aroused. Potiphar was mad. When his wife started screaming, rape, rape, rape. And he came and heard the situation. Oh, wait, wait, who, who, who tried to rape you? Joseph? Joseph tried to rape you? What? When Potiphar heard the whole story, he was angry. Do you know why he was angry? He was angry because he was stuck with his wife and because he lost Joseph. Do you understand how good Joseph made Potiphar's life? Potiphar's life was a dream because of Joseph. The only thing Potiphar had to worry about in his life because of Joseph is what he's going to eat every day. That's a pretty good life. He loses Joseph and his wife is left behind. Uh, here's what I'm trying to get at. Potiphar did not believe his wife for a moment. I can say that with pretty strong authority. How do I know that? Ladies and gentlemen, Potiphar's the head of the secret police and this is ancient Egypt. If Potiphar would have had 5% of a belief that Joseph actually did that, he would have killed him immediately. I'm the head of the secret police under Pharaoh, and you try to rape my wife, you're dead. You're dead, and any of your family I know is dead. That's it. You're forgotten. You're dead. 
He didn't kill Joseph. He had to put him in prison because the wife raised a big stink. He had to do something. But you know Potiphar looked at his wife and said, I know what's going on. I know you. I know Joseph. I know he didn't do it. I know what kind of woman you are. I know the game you're playing. And I hate that I have to do this, but I'm not going to kill this man. I'll put him in prison, but I'm not going to kill him. Because Potiphar knew exactly what was going on. So it says in verse 20, then Joseph's master put him in prison, took him and put him into the prison. Poor Potiphar, poor Joseph. Joseph went from privilege in his father's house to the pit that his brothers threw him into, to being property in the slave market, to the privilege of managing Potiphar's house, to the principled stand against temptation, to the perjury of false accusation, to the prison of Pharaoh. Come on, I put together all those P's. Doesn't that count for something? I know, I, I, come on. That's something Nate Wagner's. I never do that, but here, there's a little bone to you. Now, let me conclude with looking at three things, okay? Quick conclusion, three things. First of all, we see the mercy in this. Where's the mercy? The mercy is found in that Potiphar didn't believe his wife. If Potiphar believed his wife, Joseph would be a dead man. So there's mercy in this. That's number one. Number two, there's injustice in this. I don't want to sugarcoat this. Joseph suffered for someone else's sin. Who's the innocent one? Joseph. Who's the guilty one? Potiphar's wife. He's suffering for her sin. Now let me just ask you, can anybody else think of somebody who perfectly resisted sin, resisted temptation, and then suffered for someone else's sin? That's our Savior, Jesus Christ. Perfectly resisting temptation, then suffering for whose sin? My sin. You see, I look at this story, and um, I don't know about you, I want to see myself as Joseph in this story. You know, handsome, of course. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, uh, standing strong against all temptation and suffering for, yes, no, yes, I see my, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, that's me. And look, I hope there's some of, of, of us in Joseph. I hope you learn from Joseph and how he resisted temptation. We need to learn from that. Yes, there's something of us in Joseph, and we need to learn it. But you know who I identify more with? Potiphar's wife. I am the one for whose sin a perfect man suffered. And even when I didn't appreciate it, he paid the penalty for my sin. I'm not alone in that. It's you too. We see ourselves, yes, in Joseph, even more in Potiphar's wife. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I want to strengthen you in the stand against temptation. That's true. But for all of us who have failed to stand against temptation, your Savior suffered for you. And there is forgiveness, there is cleansing, there is restoration for you. L later tonight, uh, today at the end of our service, we're going to invite our prayer team forward. Some of you need to come up and you need to pray with people this morning. You just need to. You need to pray with people. You need to pray with people about the past, about the present, or what's coming up in the future. But this whole area of temptation and surrendering your sexual life to God, you need to come up for prayer. And even though I've held you too long already, let, let me finish with this last bit. We see God's hand in this. We see mercy in this. We see injustice in this. But we see God's hand in all of this. Because friends, if Potiphar's wife never falsely accused Joseph of rape, then Joseph is never put into prison. If Joseph is never put into prison, then he never meets the baker and the butler of Pharaoh. Pharaoh. 
If Joseph never meets the baker and the butler of Pharaoh, he never interprets their dreams. If Joseph never interprets their dreams, he never interprets Pharaoh's dream. If Joseph never interprets Pharaoh's dream, he never becomes prime minister. If Joseph never becomes prime minister, he never wisely prepares for the terrible famine to come. If Joseph never wisely prepares for the terrible famine to come, then his family back in Canaan dies in the famine. If Joseph's family back in Canaan dies in the famine, then the Messiah can't come forth from a dead family. If the Messiah doesn't come forth, then Jesus never came. And if Jesus never came, then we are dead in our sins and we're without hope in the world. We are grateful for God's great and wise plan. He knows what he's doing. Father in heaven, this is our prayer Lord, we we come to you as Potiphar's wife, as those who have been stained by sin and infected by the weird culture around us when it comes to thinking about sex and desire and all of that. We come to you as Potiphar's wife and we just say, cleanse us, Lord Jesus. We need to be cleansed. Forgive us, Lord, for seeing our identity in our sexual desires. No, Jesus, we come and we yield to you and we lay aside every idol and we say thank you for suffering, the innocent one suffering for the guilty. But Jesus, we also come to you as Joseph. I pray for the many here, Lord, who are standing strong against temptation and I pray that you'd help them to continue to stand strong. I pray that you'd clear away the fog of stupidity that comes upon people's minds. And that you'd give them a clarity of thought. Show them how much they have to lose. Build in them, Lord, a love for you, a relationship with you that makes them understand, Lord, there's no getting away with things even if they're done in secret. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being our Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Now, I didn't say amen because I got just a couple more words to say, and I just want to give a very simple, direct invitation. If there's anyone here this morning, you have not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. During this next song that Joseph plays, I'm going to invite you to come forward and to give your life to him. Today's the day. Now's the time where you can pass from darkness to light. You can pass from being guilty to being forgiven. You've heard me talk about innocence and sexual sin. You know, this is me. I need this. So come forward, come forward right now and as Joseph plays, you can give your life to Jesus Christ.